In just 30 years, it's estimated that over a third of us are going to live in cities. For comparison, a couple of centuries ago, only 3% of people lived in urban areas. Cities are the world's engine, generating four-fifths of the global GDP. But they're also responsible for 75% of global CO2 emissions. In this series, we're going to be exploring how our increasingly urban lives will be affected by climate change and what we can do to make our cities more sustainable. We're going to be looking at where we live, how we get around and what we eat. All things that affect us and the planet. In this episode, we're going to be investigating where we live and what we build. Construction is a huge contributor to the environmental footprint of cities, making the effects of climate change worse. Things like more storms, flooding and a growing population is all going to change the way that we build in the future. When you think about the future, do you imagine really grand cityscapes like Blade Runner with flying cars and endless city sprawl? Well, behind me is the Barbican, which was once envisioned as a utopian vision of the future in the 1960s and 70s. Imagined as a kind of platform city raised above the cars, it was meant to blend living spaces, public spaces and art spaces. This was once an ideal vision for what the future could look like, but what we want to find out is what the architects of today think that the future of our cities might be. More and more people are living in cities, there's been an expansive growth, so that means a number of things. Firstly, we need more housing. There's also an issue of energy usage and where does this energy come from? And finally, people are living longer. They're gonna to want to have certain kinds of housing. Where are they gonna live? You know, what do, what do we provide for them? Through sort of looking at these issues, we can face them head on by having appropriate solutions in the way that we design our buildings and our cities and think about infrastructure. Architects are waking up to the fact that Buildings are one of the most polluting things, not just buildings in use through the consumption of fossil fuels to keep them warm, but also building them in the first place. There was a report out recently that said that concrete, if it was a country, would be one of the top 10 most polluting countries. Wow. And steel involves lots of energy mm -hmm. consumption and um, sand is being dug out of riverbeds around the world and causing environmental problems. The whole property industry, the whole construction industry is incredibly wasteful. But if you go across to somewhere like the Netherlands, have a completely different mm. attitude. The, the Netherlands wants to transform its entire economy to being a circular economy. They're already talking about designing with uh, timber instead of concrete, mm -hmm. because timber, of course, is, it grows <laughs> and it retains carbon. And why do you think that we haven't quite reached up in this country? I think there's just a kind of reluctance among the powers that be to put in place long-term policies that, that will safeguard our future. And the problem with the property industry, which is obsessed with short-term profits and not in the long-term good of society or, or the city. In relation to building materials, we shouldn't just be thinking about the material during construction, but also how is it going to fare during usage, but also subsequent potential deconstruction of a building. Dismantling a building is good if you can reuse that stuff. If it's just going to go to landfill, what an awful thing. Imagining 50, 100 years in the future, what do you think London or another city in the world might look like and how might the shape of our architecture change? It's going to have to be architecture that responds to a very very different climatic conditions. Unless we start to build sustainably right now, the architecture of the future is going to be a very different proposition to what we have today. Individual changes are quite important. People need to realise that they can make a change. At some point in the future, some of these big cities are, might be partially underwater. And it might be, an, it's not until that actually happens that we do get proper change um, by government, but then it might be too late. By raising awareness, that's that first stage. And also having more projects that speak about, you know, what, what would a retirement community look like that's partially flooded half of the year? Because that might just be a condition that we have to work with rather than saying it's a problem. We just say it exists. Then how do we design with that or around that rather than saying it's a big problem, we can't do anything about it. What you tend to find also is that in certain places where people are more self-sufficient or they take it, they take the responsibility themselves, that people are very ingenious and that kind of vernacular ad hoc approach 
can solve quite a lot of problems. So we don't need these big master plans or government saying this is what we need to do. People will kind of respond and react. We're starting to see huge innovations already, from houses on stilts that deal with flooding, to bridges that connect skyscrapers so that we can live higher up, and ultimate small space living in places like Tokyo. Well, BEDZ stands for the local area, Beddington, and zero fossil energy development. The first big thing is our homes are not very energy efficient and need to be supplied with renewable energy. So you can see here we've got the big thick walls, really well insulated, so much so that we don't need central heating. So we've got a, a passive wind-driven ventilation system on the roof. Fresh air comes in, stale air goes out and warms up the fresh air coming in, so it all just happens naturally. But we had a strategy to try and make space for nature and also because it makes you feel better. I can look outside and I can see greenery rather than concrete. And then we've got uh, supplied by renewable energy, so we have photovoltaic panels which are generating electricity and we also have uh, wood chip powered hot water. <laughs> so, um, so it's all zero carbon. When city planners and architects are creating new developments, they really need to think about how is a person who's living here going to be able to live a truly sustainable zero carbon lifestyle. For a start, you've got to build in the right places and you've got to make sure there's public transport, that there are services like shops and uh, schools that are within walking distance. So we created a framework called One Planet Living, which has 10 principles from zero carbon to health and happiness, which anyone can use for their projects to design for, a sustainable, for sustainable living. And uh, we used it to write the sustainability strategy for the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. People here really like living here and it's not just about saving energy in the home. The whole idea is just to make it a little bit easier for people to be sustainable. From citywide neighbourhoods and even our homes, what do we think the things are that are going to change in the cities of the future? Sustainable architecture theoretically is architecture that has zero impact on the planet, both in use and perhaps even more importantly during its construction. Actually the building in use is the easier bit to solve because it's not that hard to build a building that doesn't consume any fossil fuels. It's achievable, it's, it's difficult to achieve in this country because of the regulations and the sort of bias towards mm. fossil fuel and there's concepts like passive house. Yeah. It's passive house is an exacting standard for low energy consumption. If water does start rising, what, what are we going to do? So we can have tactics like barriers and quite defensive structures, but actually it's quite easy to design into landscape and parks so that the water can run off. Sometimes we can put buildings on stilts. These simple things, which are passive and not too aggressive, actually help the way that these cities will evolve and avoid potential catastrophe through flooding. The best example of sustainable architecture is to walk out of this building mm -hmm. and see buildings that have been there for 200, 300, <laughs> 400 years. That's sustainable I love architecture. Because, <laughs> you know, the, the stone and the wood was cut 400 years ago and it's still mm. in use. Contemporary sustainable architecture tends to be the less flashy stuff. Yeah. It doesn't have <laughs> giant turbines whizzing around on the roof, it doesn't have shiny solar facades that are visible anyway, they're usually quite modest. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to take into account rising temperatures, that's for sure. Unless we want to use even more energy and air condition them, they need to have sort of passive cooling mm. systems, which again is easy. You just insulate them well, higher ceilings, uh, natural ventilation. It's not rocket science, actually. So simple things like the way that the building is orientated, the way the sun might come into that. We want to reduce solar gain, but also being able to open windows, have cross ventilation, passive technologies which mean that we're not using more energy, we're actually using less. Before the, the modern age, people adopted their architecture to the, the local conditions. We're going to have to start, rediscover the indigenous architectural styles from around the world, but also countries that are warming will have to learn from countries that were already warmer. Well, there's a social housing project in Norwich 
called Goldsmith Street, mm -hmm. which just won the RIBA Sterling Prize. It was named the best building in the UK mm -hmm. this year, which is an extremely low energy project. It meets passive house standards. And it was built by Norwich City Council. So this is, this is a turning point in architecture, that it's not a glamorous theatre or stadium or private dwelling. It, it's a building for ordinary people that still has extremely high environmental standards. There's definitely a sea change happening at the moment. Governments have a responsibility to help that to happen. But also designers, we have quite a say because we decide what materials might be used, the layout of a building, how much energy it might use, and we need to lead by example. So I think any tactics or strategies that we can employ as a designer, we need to think about these things early on and ensure that for the life cycle of the building, there's a real desire to make sure that we're being as friendly to the earth and future generations as possible. Cities of the future can encourage people to live more sustainably, either in relationship to energy usage or the way that they interact with each other, or even something as simple, can they catch a bus from their front door? Making where we live more sustainable isn't just something that's in the hands of architects and councils. If you live in a city, there's loads that you can do to make where you live more sustainable right now. Where you can, use your local public transport and get involved in making it better. If you want more cycle paths or buses or train routes, then make sure that you let your local representatives know. We need to let people know that we want cities that are made for people and not cars. Retrofit your home to make it more sustainable. Really, really easy changes like adding insulation, putting up thick thermal curtains or covering up drafts can all help reduce energy in homes that weren't built to modern efficiency standards. If you have a garden, a balcony, or even a window box, why not try growing something? Busy cities can put loads of pressure on green spaces, which are great for wellness. They feed pollinators, and they even help mitigate the effects of climate change. Even with a tiny, tiny space, you can make a huge difference. I want to find out what you think the cities of the future are going to look like. Next week, we're going to be having a look at how we get around and how transport can be more sustainable. But until then, make sure you subscribe to the Hubbub channel to be the first one to see all of our videos. And thank you so much for watching. And that's the end of the episode. To find out more and to get inspired, head to our website, www.hubbub.org.uk, where you'll find loads of top tips to give you the spark to do things differently. Tune in for the next episode and come and join the hubbub.